This is not an official podcast of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution, NSDAR, and does not necessarily represent the position of the NSDAR. This interview is being conducted for the Daughter Dialogues Oral History Project. The interviewer is Risha Rainey. The narrator is Stephanie Miller. Stephanie, when were you born? 1963. Where were you born? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Where did you grow up? I was a Navy brat for the first eight years of my life. My father was stationed in Rota, Spain, Newport Beach, Rhode Island, and um, Great Lakes, Illinois. Then he retired. Then we moved to San Jose, California in the 1970s, which to me was the best decade for being a child. My mother got me involved with brownies and junior Girl Scouts. She helped me win the first prize in selling the cookies. Back in my day, we didn't have a stand in front of the stores where they just hand you the cookie box. We had to go door to door, take an order, take the money, then wait for a couple of weeks for the, the box of cookies to come and then go back to the houses to deliver. What type of neighborhood did you grow up in? Was it black or white? My childhood, as far as I'm concerned, is really actually in San Jose, California. It was a very integrated neighborhood. We had whites, Hispanics, blacks. So all my friends were of different races. It was so integrated that we even had um, the family members of a devil priest. He was a famous devil's priest in San Francisco. Well, his family lived on our street. Where did you go next? In ninth grade, we moved back to Westchester, Pennsylvania. And that's where I graduated from Henderson Senior High School. What initiated the move to Pennsylvania? My father's family was is on the East Coast, and he wanted since we had spent all this time in California, which was my mom's side of the family. He wanted to spend time on the East Coast on my his side of the family. Did you attend college afterwards? Yes, I went to Penn State University. What did you study? Human development. So after studying human development, did you go to use that education in your professional field? Actually, I did not. I I, I met my husband. My, fiance, which was my boyfriend at the time, and he asked me to marry him, so I married him. I married him at age 21 years old. He went into the Air Force, so we were stationed in Bossier City, Louisiana for six years. What did you do while you were in Louisiana? When I was in Louisiana, I had one son. While I had him, I went started going to nursing school, and I graduated. What did you do with your nursing education? Well, by that time, after six years was up, we moved back to California, and we moved to Sacramento, California. In Sacramento, California, I became a pediatric home care nurse. I took care of children from, from six weeks old to 14 years old. They were traked and on ventilators. So I did that for 10 years. Did some of them recover? This was going to be their lifestyle for the rest of their life. Other than being on a ventilator, they were, they were regular children as acting, playing. What kind of ailments would cause them to be on a ventilator? A lot of them had trachea malaysia, where the trachea just wouldn't stay open. Were there any memorable, I'm sure all of your patients that you served were memorable, but was, were there any particular situations that stand out to you? There was one that I attended school with, so I became a teacher for her, and I grew up to till she was pretty much 10 years old. But I, I, I caught in touch with her on Facebook about five, six years ago. Now that she's married and have children, and her little girl just looked like her when she was a little girl. And what else did you do after the years that you spent being a pediatric in-home nurse? We opened up an adult residential care home. My mother, my brother, my, fa- my husband, it was, a whole, it was a family group. You all started a family business. Whose idea was this? My mother's. Why was your mother wanting to start a family business? What was her background? Okay, my mother, like I said, she started out as being a um, stay-at-home mom when my dad was in the service. And then when we moved to San Jose, she went into the workforce force. And she started working for um, Pacific Bell. She worked for Pacific Bell for a couple of years, and then she got the entrepreneur bug. So she opened up a restaurant. She sold real estate, and then she went and opened the, um, the, the adult residential care home. And then she retired. Where was she from originally? Oakland, California. So when your mother decided to open this business, did she immediately suggest that you 
all run it with her? Oh, well, she, she put the idea out there, but I was the one that became the administrator and went and found out all the, the laws and licensing about it. And I prepared the, the application for the business, got all the, the house prepared for the business. So she actually, she got the house that we used. She bought the house and we used it as a adult residential care home. Then my brother, who was living in Pennsylvania, he came down, he came from Pennsylvania to, to still help run the business also. What was your husband doing during this time? My husband was attending school at this time. He was going to uh, California State University, and then he was helping us with the business too. So we would work shifts, like me and my husband would work the first week, and then my husband, my brother and his wife would work the other week. So it was like we had seven days on and seven days off. What was everyone's roles? You were doing the administrative part of it. Your mother secured the home. What did everyone else do? Well, we also had to be, I had two hats. I was administrator, but I also was a direct support professional, means that we were in the house. We were the ones that was um, was taking them out into the community, trying to make them as independent as they could be. We're the ones that cook their meals for them. We're the ones that help them with their activities of daily living. You had other staff? Uh, the, we were the staff, my, me and my husband, and then my brother and his wife was the other week. How many residents did you take care of? We had six residents, six males. Did these males have other family members that could have taken care of them but chose not to? Or were they pretty much on their own? Did they um, have family? They have, um, the, the clients that we have were development delays, but also might have some behavioral issues where it might be too much for families as the parents are getting older to be able to, to, to take care of their children, adult children at home. So that's why they are out into the community. But they would come in and, and visit the, the, their, their children very often, take them away on weekends at times, like during the holidays. So the, their parents were very much involved. They just couldn't be able to have their adult children living with them 24-7. We, we treated like family. We went on vacations. We you know, took them on vacations with us. We, we, like I said, we, we were there the other weeks. We were there on holidays with them. So they became part of our family. If we had birthday parties, we would have it there. So none of us would miss it because we were working. So we would, we'd bring our family involved. So no one would, and we, if like our children were in, were playing football, basketball, they went with us and watched the football and basketball games. They went out in the community and able to watch the games as well. So we didn't lose out and part of our family life and they got to be involved in our family. Did you enjoy it? Yes, I did. Are you still doing that today? Yes, but in different apps, instead of having a residential home, we have an agency and we supply support living coaches and personal supports to people who live in their own place. They don't live in a group home. They live in their own apartment or their own house as the renters. They hire us to make sure they go to their doctor's appointments, to advocate for them, for their rights, for prepare their meals. Where are you operating out of now? Are you still in California? When my children were in high school, we decided we wanted my children to go to school, college on the East Coast. So we chose Florida to move to because that was the closest thing to weather of California. So we, we moved to Orlando, Florida. Why did you want to be on the East Coast? Well, since we were in California on my mom's side, we didn't want to go back to East Coast to be on my dad's side of the family and where my dad was. So being with divorced parents, we try to split our time in between, between both of them. But with my mom, my mom went with us. So we came to Florida. We brought my mom with us. My mom lives with me now. How old were you when your parents divorced? The, I was 13 when my parents divorced. Was your dad still in the military and traveling? Were you able no, to see him? No, my dad had already had retired. And my mom had started working at the Pacific Bell. So it was in like probably um, four years after he retired. So how did the two of them end up on separate coasts? Well, my mom stayed in California and we moved to meet my father. My father became the, um, he became the stay at home father. When he retired, he was our, no, he was our father that was at home. So he became our, our caretaker at home. So 
when they got divorced, we still had my father being role changed. He had, had the mother role and she had the father role. She was out working and he was home. So we chose to stay with my father being that he was home. We needed somebody to be home for us. So he decided to move to Pennsylvania. We went with him to Pennsylvania. But like I said, the roles were reversal. And I felt that my brother and I needed someone home during the day because my brother was getting to an age, I was getting to an age where I think we had need that, that we, that was before kids do it now, but at that time we, we, we were like the first, the first divorce family on the street where we were in, we always, this, the street that we lived on always had one parent home and one parent that was working. So the role reversal of my mom working and my dad staying home, it just made sense to follow my dad since he would always be home for us if we still needed. Being, instead of being latchkey kids. This is, is very sensitive for me about the little boards. My mother served for a Navy spouse during her early childhood. She used to stay at home and was a domestic goddess for, for my younger brother and myself. She gave us a solid foundation in our early childhood learning. <sighs> Cause my dad's side of family thinks, how can my mom let her let, let her kids go like that? And it wasn't her choice. She didn't want us to go. I just thought getting together for the first time, being together, let you know, without him going away, they outgrew each other. So I thought maybe if we did move as a kid, I thought if we moved to Pennsylvania, maybe she would miss us so much that she would just come back, you know, move with, you no know, move to, go move to Pennsylvania also. Like I said, my mom was the one that signed me up for Girl Scouts. My dad didn't want me to do Girl Scouts. My dad was, my dad wasn't the type of person that, that, that believe in socialism, socializing so much. So my mom, you no, know, had to go like behind his back and sign me up for Girl Scouts. So your mom had your back. Yeah. We, me, and my brother was, you know, sleep in her bed and watch TV stuff with her at night, stuff like Creature Feature, um, Hee Haw, Lawrence Welk Show. She was our mom. And since she didn't have a husband that's home, so so we became, you know, we, we, we were, we were, me, my brother and her were like three amigos. So after you had the opportunity to move to Florida, you made sure mom came with you this yes. time. Yes, yes, we did. That's why we, after I, my husband and I got out of the Air Force, which we were in Louisiana, we moved to California so I could be near her be with her in California. That, that was the first time since after divorce that we that we lived together, lived in the same state. How did that feel being back in the same state together? It felt very good. It felt, you know, I had I had my son, so she got to be, you know, a grandmother. And then with my second son, she was there from the very beginning. She was there when I gave birth. I had her, my son, and my husband in the labor room. So they were all three, they all Three of them were there to see the birth of my second son. And then she helped, you know, she did the babysitting and stuff. So she, she was, with my second son, she was there from the very beginning through, through my pregnancy to now, that now he is a father. So she's now seen his son. So I felt like something I would you know, something that I made up for that now. The time she didn't have us, I made up for it now. So when... All of you got to Florida. And Florida, you, she retired. She retired, but yes. did you stay near each other? Yes, we did. Yes. How close are you as far as physical distance apart? At that time, we first moved here, and we were about, I would say, about three, four miles apart. <laughs> yeah. And then after just only recently, the past five years, she's now living with me. Is your father still living? My father's living. He lives in North Carolina and he has also a house in Florida. How often do you get to see your father? I get to see my father at least 
two, two, three times a year. We go on vacations together. He's remarried. He's been married now for 37, 38 years now. And I have two baby sisters with his, from his second wife. And we, as a family, we go on trips together. We go on some cruise together. We went to Las Vegas. So every year, we seem to, to, to find a way to have a, either a trip, vacation trip, or we have a wedding, or we spend Christmas together. So we, as a whole family unit, including my mom, we spend that time together. What do you like to do in your spare time when you're not doing the professional work? I'm also a genealogist. I've been doing genealogy for about 22 years. I also love to do traveling. I've been to Morocco. When I went to, to Italy two years ago, we also went to Amsterdam and I've been to Paris. I also like to put jigsaw puzzles together, photography and ceramics. So how did you get into genealogy? Well, one year my mom had told me that um, a friend of hers told her my mom's mom my, my mom didn't know much about her family but she knew that her one of her great-grandfather's last name was Shake Snyder and the woman that she was talking to was of German descent and she told her hey I have my great-grandfather's name is Shake Snyder and the woman who's I guess she's she's very she goes to Germany is very familiar with Germany and the surnames says she never heard of a surname Shake Snyder you they must meant shakes inward and not negro but the woman actually said that they must mean shakes inward so my mom told me this and i said well you know what i gotta find this out so that's how i started started trying to find out who her great-grandfather was and how he got the name shakes snyder being an african-american and last last name shakes snyder what does inward mean Nigger. Shake Snader. What was his first name? Vilmont. Vilmont Shake Snader was who to you? It was my third great grandfather. And what was the story about him? My story about him that he was in the United States Color Troop in Patterson, Louisiana. And his father was a white man. His slave owner was Louis Roussel. So that tells me, well, Roussel wasn't his, his, his father. And in, in, in the documentations, Roussel, Roussel told me that Vilmont's father was a white man. So I went researching where Louis, Louis Roussel lived at and saw that it was Shake Snyder's lived nearby. And also that he had Shake Snyder's that married into the Roussel family. So I went researching, I went, in fact, I went to Louisiana and went to the courthouses and I also then went to, on a, on a uh, spare time, went to the plantation called Laura's Plantation. Well, during the Laura's Plantation, there was a travel guide, the tourist guide, and his name was Jay Snakeslide. I said, oh, you're Jay Snakeslide. I've seen you on, on the internet. He says, yeah. I said, okay. I said, well, we're Snakeslides too. And then he told me a story. He said, well, in my research, I saw that, that there was one guy who shakes Snyder who had children, who had mulatto children. So most likely this guy here is the, your, your, um, the grandfather, the, the father of your Vilmont. And so I went deeper and deeper and I found more stuff on it and it, it turned out to be true. When you went on this tour of Laura Plantation, did you know, you said you had seen his name, the tour guy's name. Did you expect to run into him there? No, or was this I did total not. Coincidence? I, did not, I did not know he worked there. No. The only reason why it came up, because when he introduced himself, he just introduced himself as Jay all through the tour. It wasn't until we got back to the store of the uh, Laura's Plantation and I saw a map and it had where the plantations were on the map and they had Shake Snyder plantation. And I said, mom, there's a Shake Snyder plantation. And that's where he overheard me talking to my mom. And that's how I ended up saying what his last name was. So you discovered that this indeed was a connection. Yes. And tell me about the connection and how you found out. Well, he told me the gentleman's name which is Norbert Shakespeare, saying that he possibly can be, be you know, your, your Vilmont's father because he was known to have children, mulatto children. 
he did not have a she was enslaved we never found out what Vilma's mother's name was but we know she was enslaved well he gave me the um the phone number to Norbert Schneider's descendants who also I guess researching too so I guess he was going to write Jay was going to write a Shake Snyder's book so that's why he talked to a whole talk talk to all the Shake Snyder's he can that was on the internet so he knew of this family so he gave me the phone number to Norbert's descendant I called that when we got back home I called the, the descendant and said hi um, Jay you know gave me your phone number and said that maybe we might can change off information that about you know your your grandfather or great grandfather Norbert Shake Snyder and I explained my my part of the history and she said well I don't know why Jay is sending you to me I told Jay this is not this, no, this, my Norbert is not the father of these children and I said okay I'm sorry for disturbing you and call it a day well five years later we start doing DNA testing I am um, I had my mother do her DNA test and then the first person that popped up as being a close relative was that person I talked on the phone was that a white person Norbert's descendant that yes. you sp spoke to the possible father of Vilmont she was just denying that they had these children did she know that you were African-American yes, calling her yes she did do you think she didn't know or she was knowing and just not telling you no, I or admitting think, I, it. I think people are in denial of things and I think you no know, I don't think she was trying to be you no know, mean about it I just think she just thought it, no it didn't happen that way most people don't want to think of that of their of their ancestors of most like their possibility of raping people they don't want to think that of their of their ancestors so it's best just to say to to ignore and say oh no this can't be so the DNA test that you took linked you to this Norbert descendant yes and then, then a, oh and then a whole bunch of other white Shake Snyders and other surnames that c connected to the Shake Snyder so did you contact her again and tell her that hey I know you said that this <laughs> that Vilmont <laughs> did not descend from Norbert no, but I did our not. DNA matches. I did not, but I know on her side, she sees, a, a, she'll see African American people on her side as being her cousins. So I didn't have to say anything because I know she could see that. When you say she can see it, are you talking about where would she see this information? They t the DNA testing tells you your your ethnicity, but it also tells you other people that who are your first, second, third, fourth cousins. On. So you think that she would be looking up her own DNA? Would she have to take a DNA test that's too how, to she, see she, it? That's how, I, that's how she popped up as being my cousin because she did take her DNA test. So now that you're registering in there as a match, now what it updates her results to where she can see that now she has an African ancestry match or... Yes. It, it tells her all her cousins that matches hers and it tells the ethnicity of all the cousins. Have you contacted any of the white Shea Snyders? Oh, yes. Yes, Scott, when, when I found out, um, Jay, Jay turns up you know, being on my list of cousins, too. So, Jay Shea Snyder, so. So, you actually met one because you met him because he was the tour guide at Laura yes. Plantation. Yes. How did you reach out to the other ones, and what did they say when you did contact them, or did they contact you? I mean, I have, there's a lot of cousins on that list, and I've pretty much tried to write and wrote to them a you know, little message, but I didn't get that many responses. But there's about three or four that has, you know, say, hey, cuz, and, you know, and we'll talk. So there's about there's four of them that, 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 that claim me as their cousin. Have you met them in person or talked to them on the phone? No, I have not. I've talked to about two on Facebook. What sort of things do you talk about? Well, um, the first few conversations was they wanted me to help them find their connection. Cause a lot of people had the know they see that we're cousins, but they don't know how they didn't go further back on Shake Snyder name. So they might be one name, but they know how they relate to me. So I had to show them how their lineage leads back to Shake Snyder. What about during your research? You said you like genealogy. I imagine you've researched other family lineage or other family lines. In your genealogy, what else have you discovered? 
Well, my one of my favorite pieces that I found was on back to Vilmont. Vilmont is, is was is my pride and joy because he was my first official find. Well, when I found out that he was in the United States Color Troop, I ordered his um United his service records, military pension and widow's pension records. And I came home one day and there was this large package at my doorstep because I didn't know what to expect him. There was a large package at my doorstep. I opened up and it was pages of documentation. First, it was his um his um his physicals and stuff. So it had all the documentations on his physical. Then it had his um asking for pension. So it had his verbal documentation of him explaining who he was, how old he was, and you know who was he enslaved by, and what wounds he had. How did you even initiate getting this package? I got his um his military identification number off Ancestry.com. So I was able to order his his pension records, his military records, and his widow's pension records from from the National Archives. How did it make you feel to see these records, and what did you see? I was floored. I was excited because I didn't know what to expect. It's like a couple pages, and that'd be it. But it was pages on top pages. I'm pretty much gonna say about seventy six pages of information. And one of the most important pieces that I just fell in love with was actually from his wife who was requesting widow's pension. My grandma, Vilma had passed away. So now she was requesting widow's pension. And I have it here if you'd like me to read it. Yes. What parts stand out to you in that request? She said, I was born in the parish and was the property of Octave Cornet. I belonged to him until I got free. My father was Paul Kilio and my mother was Harriet, belonging to the same man. During the war, I went off to Lafayette, Louisiana with my master's family, and I was in Lafayette when I got free. After I got free, I came back here and have lived here in Patterson ever since. While I'm under my master at Lafayette, Louisiana, I took up with one Henry Alexander, and I lived with him for about a year. I was never married to him, and I, not, I did not go through any sort of marriage ceremony with him. We just lived together by mutual consent. I did not go by his name, but I had one child, a boy named William, was born. And soon after birth, I left Lafayette and came back here. Henry Alexander, I suppose, lives in Lafayette now. I have now seen him since I left there. So pretty much what she was saying was that she was in a shacking relationship with Henry Alexander. Plantation owners encourage the slaves to have children and they start childbearing around age 13 and by 20 the woman slaves would be expected to have four or five children. So to encourage childbearing some plantation owners promise women slaves their freedom after they have produced 15 children. So she was explaining to the pension people that she wasn't married to this William Henry that she wasn't even even having really a relationship with them. That was pretty much there for shacking up. Means that she was there to get pregnant. He was pretty much a stud for her. Then she went on to say that she she can't tell what time the year that Vilmont Shakespeare came home from the service. But we married the next year after he came home. I had lived on Calumet Plantation from my return until my marriage. I've been back from Lafayette three years before I married Vilmont. He got a license at Franklin, Louisiana to marry me. And Anderson Tibbs, the minister, is dead, said the ceremony. Joe Robinson, Henry Ellis, August Johnson, and Yokely Haynes all saw us marry. I did not marry him the first year, but I took up with him. And sometime in the 80s, he got a license and married me. I never separated from Vilmont Shakespeare since we first went together. We live right together as man and wife until his death. I have continued to live here in this home where he left me with my children. I own no property except this house and a lot, and I'm dependent on my own labor for support. When I file my claim, I have three children under 16 years old, named as follow. Then she goes on to, to name her children. So she gives me her six children. She gives me her slaveholder. She gives me her parents' names. She gives me her parents' slaveholder. 
So all this information I did not have before that I now have due to these, the documentation. How did that story impact you knowing that after she got her freedom, she decided to find someone she really wanted to be with, who was Vilmont, and got married to him? I was excited to know that she she written down that she you know that that wasn't her choice to be with Henry. She you no, know, she made that she she didn't say, Oh, I got married you no, know, I didn't she have to take married, but I was with Henry and you no, know, we did he died or he did not she you know, she made a point to say that I don't know if he's there or not. I don't really much care. I came back home with my child. So that tells me that the proudness that she had to even to say that to come out of her mouth to say that that way that her love was only for Vilmont. So tell me about your Revolutionary War Patriot. How did you find out that you descended from someone who contributed to the American Revolution? Well, I was on Ancestry.com and I saw a, um, I go, I go browsing through people who have, you know, names, surnames in my tree. I go look at other people, see what, no, if they have the same surnames. Well, this one tree had, actually had my second, my, no, my fourth great grandmother in her tree. And you know, I knew it was her because she had her married to my fourth great grandfather. So it's a Serena and her husband, Samuel Pritchett. Now, Serena Samuel Pritchett was my, my roadblock there. That's as far as I got with Samuel and, and Serena. I couldn't get any further back on either lineage for years. So they were just, they were my heads right now. So I saw her have this, you know, Serena on there and, I, and Samuel and where they're living at, which was in Caroline County, Maryland. But I saw that she had Serena's name as her surname is Dew. So I, 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 I wrote her a note, a message. I said, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a descendant of Serena and um, Samuel Pritchett. And I noticed you have a surname for her. How do you, how'd you get to her surname? She wrote me back and she said, well, Serena's father was um, in the American Revolution War and that he had some documentations stating who his children were and that his children were Serena, who was married to Samuel Pritchett, living in Caroline County. I said, oh, meanwhile, I am I know that Serena and Samuel has been listed as mulattoes on the census. So I knew there was you know, a mulatto there. But in our family history, was we were told that they were half, they were Native American and African American. And possibly on Samuel Pritchard's side might be even some European in his lineage. So that's what we knew. So now she's telling me that Serena's father was in the um, American Revolution War named James Dew. So she told me that she gave me some information about it. And so I'm assuming that James Dew was white and that he must have had a, um, a, a female, some of his partner, who was either Native American or she was African American. Why did you assume that James Dew was white? Because the, 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 the person I was talking to, she was white. So I'm um, so, then you're saying that was her great grand, great grandfather. So she was already, they, she was already claiming James Dew as her great grandfather and that Serenity would be, would have been her, her descendant's um, sister. So they knew Serenity was mulatto, but their lineage is white. From James Duan, their lineage is white. They used to assume also that he must have had a, a Native American or African American partner that, that, that birthed Serena. So she gave me the information about James Dew, about him being in the American Revolution War, that he was a prisoner of war and everything. So I took it further and started researching James Dew. So I went and found the census, the 1800 census, 1810 census, and 1800 census, he's listed as Negro. I said, okay. 
So I went to the 1810 census, and he's listed as Negro. So now I'm starting thinking, this person's Negro. So I go, and um, I already had the Forgotten Patriots book on my internet from the DAR. The Forgotten Patriots book, which lists women and men of color who served in the American Revolution? Yes. I had looked on it before trying to find my uh, any surnames of my uh, my my ancestors, and I didn't never found it. So I said, well, let me check out James Dew. So I went in the book and looked in Maryland, and there he was, James Dew. So James Dew is listed in the book as being a Negro. But why were you looking for before you found James Dew? Why were you always kind of searching? in the Forgotten Patriots book before you got to James Dew and learned that you did have a potential ancestor who was in the American Revolution. Why did I assume that I might have an ancestor? Because I knew my, my ancestors were here from beginning, for at least from the 1600s, I believe that they were here. So I, I felt that someone in my family had to be in the American Revolution War. But many people don't even know that People of color contributed to the American Revolution. They certainly don't know about the Forgotten Patriots publication, and it doesn't usually happen in reverse. So it seems like you were searching this book, looking for Revolutionary War ancestors first, and then you found one. <laughs> so I was just curious how you decided that you were going to be researching in this DAR publication listing these patriots in the American Revolution before you even identified one. I, I suppose just being a history buff, I always felt that that um, African, well, they weren't African Americans at the time, but I felt that people of descendant of Africa have been here since the beginning of time in this country. That that that's. That they had to been in, a, you know, in the war. So you found James Dew found in James the Dew. in the Forgotten Patriots listing, which meant that he was a patriot of the American Revolution. So how did you feel when you found that? What did you do next? I was excited. I had actually already told my the, my other family researchers of the same lineages that um, about him. But I was even more excited to go back, come back, go back to tell them that he was an African American, because everybody else was going to assume that he was also white. But the fact to tell them that no, he's actually African American, that was a very big thing. Did you go back to the white descendant? Of oh no, I, well, I went back to them. But I'm talking James about I, I'm, first. I'm talking about my cousins who I, um, who my research, my researching cousins. That are we, we both descend from Samuel and Serena Pritchett, so we all been talking for years together. We don't you know some of us don't haven't met each other, but we've been talking over years on internet, on phone stuff, researching for you know, trying to get this lineage further than Samuel and Serena. So it was, those people were the ones I ran to and said, "Hey, he's African American." Yeah. So I went back to 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 the cousin, and, and it was two of them, two cousins. I went back to two cousins and said, hey, this person is, um, no, I actually said, are you sitting down? I said, this person is, is African, no, James Dew is actually African American. And I, I had the proof, I had the, the, the DRI recognizing as being African American. Um, there's a writer who, who listed them in the Free African Americans in the 1800s. He's listed in that book as well. In the census, he's listed as, as, as Negro. And their thinking was, it must have been sort of a mistake that he might have been at. They, they were told that they were Native American. So they were assuming maybe that he was Native American and they listed him as Negro in the census. They knew they had something mysterious in their lineage, but they thought the mysterious was Native American, not African American, because they were told that they were Scottish. James Dew was Scottish, he, that he came from Scotland, that his kids had um his his kids had a Scottish bro, bro, um, dialect, so this is what they they were told these th throughout the years about their great great grandfather who was a patriot, but he was a Scottish patriot. As as I was researching 
in one of the paperwork, it says he was living, he was a man of, you know, he was a man of color, free man of color, but there was a white woman that was living with him. So I'm assuming that the white woman is the mother of the children. And that she probably was an indentured servant. And she was one probably from Scotland. So that's where the Scottish is coming in at. Did he have a wife? Or this is the no. only woman that you identified? She did, he did not get married. The reason why he didn't get married, because at that time, black and white could not marry. So he did not have a black wife. He did not have a black wife, no. What does the other descendant, the white descendant, how, how does she list the mother of their ancestor from James Dew? What was the, the ancestor that they came down through? What was that They name? came down from Enoch. So what did they list as Enoch's mother? Was it just blank on that their blank. tree? It was blank. Yeah, it was blank. And Enoch, as you, you can see through the, the past census with him, he, they were light, they were fair skin, light skin children. And as adults, you could see that he was wrestling with, with the past, the, the couple census. One census, he's, 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 he's listed as mulatto. Then one census, he's listed as white. The next one, he's listed as mulatto. Then finally, he was listed as white. And then from then on, he, he stayed white. His descendants were white. You you see that little battle that was going through. Like I don't know if it was not him saying he was mulatto, but somebody who the census taker said, "Hey, I know your father. You're mulatto." So he could have been battling with the census people, you know, as far as what they're going to list him. So for so we have two two we have a brother and sister. One lived as white, and one lived as mulatto. Now. The, the white side of the family, Enoch's family, was told generation after generation about James Dew. They in fact supposed to have his sword and, and everything else. And so they have relics from James Dew and they were proud passing it down that he was in the American Revolution War. But he was Scottish. And they didn't know that he was black at this time or Negro. No, they did not know. They just were proud of that they had a Revolutionary War patriot. Yes. Whereas... Serena, which is she's my on my lineage, we didn't know her parents. We didn't know her last name. That didn't we didn't know anything about a um, ancestor being in the American Revolution War. That wasn't passed down to us. And when children was had died in their death certificates, they never even mentioned Serena's name. They had say they're Samuel Pritchard, but Serena you might have few would say Serena, but a lot of them would say unknown. Did you f find any information about why Serena's descendants wouldn't want to um, mention her or James? No, I did not find anything whack because she actually out she outlives her husband Samuel, and and half the children named their their children their daughters after her Serena, so they had a relationship with Serena. It's just that I guess it wasn't important importance. I mean, it was Ma probably. They know her as Ma and left it like that. They also had about eight children. I do know that when he was good, when he died, they were not going to give his children his land because they were born out of wedlock. But they went to the Maryland state courts and they won. And that's how we got the name of her name as being married to Samuel Pritchard because they mentioned in the law that Enoch, John, and Serena do, who's married to Samuel Pritchett, were awarded the land even though they were born out of wedlock. So either the courts held a high respect for James Do and allowed this law to overturn. Something happened to allow this law to overturn. So I've met descendants from all the eight children and none had any oral history either, other than they heard they were Native American. That's the only, and possibly Samuel Pritchett might have been from a white Pritchett. But DNA so far has shown us that the male, the father's son descendants from Samuel Pritchett is actually an African male Habler group. So the oral history that Samuel Pritchett was a white man is, is being falsified right now.
because we because all the ones of the the father son Pritchett males that we have tested all have African haplogroup. But they there was no story, no history on Serena. Did you ever contact any of Enoch's descendants? Did did you take a DNA test and that matched to them? Yes. The same person I have them? been talking to, the same right. two people I've talked to, they're on the, my uh, my DNA cousin list. And they too actually have a small chromosome, section on the chromosome of, of African American. Did you talk to them about it after all of this was revealed? I did talk to them about it. And and I talked to them again when I, I got accepted into the American, the Daughters of American Revolution, because I'm thinking why, you know, you all had the information why haven't you done it? And I, I can't read their minds. But likely, I think most likely they didn't want to open up anything in their family as far as they were thinking that James Dew was Scottish. Now to say James Dew was African American, that's okay for them to know, but they might not want to put it out there for everybody to know. How did they react when you talked to them? They didn't really have a conversation after that. So they just kind of shut down. Yes. Stop talking. Mm -hmm. Tell me about his service. He was born about 1758. In the spring of 1778, he enlisted in the company commanded by Captain John Hawkins of Queens Ann County in the 5th Maryland Regiment. He was in several skirmishes in the war. He was taken prisoner by the refugees at the Battle of Elizabethtown for 11 months. He re-enlisted and was at the siege of Yorktown, and then the capture of the British Army under Lord Cornwallis. In 1783, James Dew was discharged from service in Annapolis, Maryland. He resided in Caroline County, Maryland. He was the area shoe cobbler. He received his pension. He died in 1832. That's my fifth great-grandfather, James Dew. Did it change how you felt about yourself once you learned that your ancestor fought for the independence of this country? It made me feel proud to know that we know I could say, hey, I have ancestors who fought too. We're, we're just much as important as anybody else. We were here from the beginning of, of the birth of the United States of America. My my family, my ancestors who also fought for freedom as well. Their freedom might be a little bit more. They might want more freedom than what we were getting, but they did fight for the for, you know, for freedom of against the British rule. Did you feel more entitled or did you feel more American because of it? Yeah, I feel more American. I feel like now when people used to say, go back to Africa, I said, no, I was, I'm, I was here before Ellis Island. My ancestors were here before Ellis Island. I am American. You joined the Daughters of the American Revolution in June of 2019. That's not even that long ago. That's just a little over a year ago. Yes, I just missed being the one million daughter of the American Revolution. I was like 600, 600 um, people off. Why did you join? I wanted to represent my, great, my, third, my fifth great grandfather, James Dew. Let him not be forgotten anymore. Is that because you felt like the family forgot him by not telling and passing down his story or yes. his name? Yes, that is true. He's he's buried somewhere that's a national state park of Maryland, and no one knows that he that he lived there, that he owned property there. That's something I'm I'm going to be working on in the next coming years. My home, my family didn't know, so how can I expect the 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 city to know? Where is he buried in Maryland? Hillsboro, Caroline County, Maryland, in the um, Tuckahoe State National Park. And there's no grave marker? No, there's no grave marker. Did any of your family members kind of question why you would want, or colleagues or associates, did anyone try to question why you would want to join the DAR considering its past history of excluding members that look like you? Most, I didn't have anybody saying why. Because most people don't know the history of my family, don't know the history of Daughters of the American Revolution. It wasn't until after I decided to join, then my mom looked it up and said, oh, you know, this is about Mary Anderson, right? You know, that's when she came up. Once you got accepted, did, how did that feel? My um, inauguration day, 
it was no meeting. It wasn't. It wasn't really about me becoming a Daughters of America representative that day. It's because it was held at the our chapters held at a country club. So what I was thinking is that here I am being accepted into the Daughters of American Revolution in a country club that probably wouldn't accept me a couple of years ago to even be there. And then also just down the block, just down the block outside the gate of this country club in 1920 is where they hanged a man called Ju Ju July Perry. He got hanged there on in November of 1920 because he wanted to vote in a Coy, Florida. It's called the Coy Massacres because when the blacks wanted to vote, there was a little scrimmage and things went wild and they burned Okoye down and had the blacks, they're like Rosewood, they just, they left Okoye because the judge, because it's a flu, affluent area, the judge of um, Orlando had lived right, you know, right in, in behind the clubhouse and he had told the blacks to go ahead and, and vote. Well, the Koi people wanted to make make a point to say, "Don't you tell our blacks to vote?" And they sent they they took they they took July, and they hanged them right there in front of the 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 country club that I got inaugurated. So that's what I was thinking that day. In fact, when people were were congratulating me, I was telling that story to those to the sisters that day, because I I felt the need that I had to say that. Yeah, I'm proud for the, you know, doing this, but I'm also proud that I'm able to do this in a cl in a clubhouse that didn't, wouldn't accept me because of my color. That hanged a man just right outside the gates right here because he was a, a man of color who wanted to vote in 1920. How did that make the other members feel? Did they feel a little uncomfortable? I don't know. At that time, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice any reaction? Were they just kind of speechless and said, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and at my particular table, <laughs> and my sister, the majority of the, of the women were from up north. I wasn't actually sitting with the ones who were actually from the south. They were, so they were a little bit more, okay, oh, okay, you're telling history we didn't know about type situation than of the people that, of, a, of the south. What does being a member of the DAR mean to you? Being a member of the DAR means um, a sense of pride that that I, uh, that I have an ancestor that fought for his freedom, and and if it can it still be same if it was if it was a white ancestor, you know, who's fought for the freedom against the British, that he that he was part of the history of making America. Um, being with the sisters, the the sisters uh, that I, that I buy have been associated with, with, have been very nice, very friendly, very open with me. Uh, they invite me to their homes on unofficial, you know, meetings. We just you know just to just just hang out. They 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 were open arms for me, so much that they asked me this year. They asked me to ask to be the historian of the chapter. So I'm now the historian of the chapter, and I'm also the um, chairman of the women's issue. So within the first year, I have done a lot. I've assisted with uh, our conferences that we've we've held, our Florida local Florida conferences that we have held, state conferences. Being the fact that I I've I got accepted as the Daughters of American Revolution, that it opened up to my cousins. And what do you think that would do for them? Are they interested in joining the DAR? Oh yes, they are S A R and D A R. I have two male, three males, and two females. The sons of the American Revolution. Yes. What would that mean? Have they talked about that? Of what that would mean to them? What do you? What would you feel if they all joined the D A R and S A R? It would make James do proud to know that his descendants are feeling a proudness about what he's done. So. The fact that he was able to to go and fight for this country, be a prisoner of war, and then go back and re-enlist and fight for his country. And that his descendants who found him now and now telling his story. So 
now that my grandchildren will know and their grandchildren will know that James do when they when they're in, in the history class and learning about American Revolution War, they can say, Hey, I had a, a seventh, eighth, ninth great grandfather who was fighting in that war also. Mm-hmm.